Hello, and welcome to the Current Science and Technology podcast from the Museum of Science in Boston. I'm your host, Susan Heilman, and every week we bring you interviews with guest researchers and our museum staff covering science and technology in depth. Nano Days, a week of all things very, very, very tiny, was celebrated this March across the country, including at the Museum of Science Boston. This year, the Museum of Science hosted dozens of scientists, including our guests today, Dr. George Whitesides and Dr. Don Ingber. Today I have with me very special guest, Dr. George Whitesides, a chemist at the chemistry department at Harvard University. And he's here to talk to us about simple and cheap medical diagnostics. Hi, Dr. Whitesides. Hello. Happy to be here. Well, thanks for being here today. It's an honor to get to speak with you. So briefly, before we get into the actual science here, why cheap diagnostics? We're interested in cheap diagnostics for several reasons. The most important one is that we share a vision originally focused on by the Gates Foundation of trying to provide useful medical services for the developing world where cost and simplicity is everything. So our technical program has as the immediate focus building medical technology that provides useful function at as close to zero cost as we can make it. An interest that goes along with it is that the idea of simple and cheap and rugged is also interesting for the military, for homeland security, for home health care, for a wide variety of other things, including agricultural health, uh, animal health, a wide range of different applications. If you can get information that's relevant to health and make it inexpensive, lots of people will use it. Which is true of a lot of things, specifically in the health area. Right. And so what have you worked on in order to have this cheaper medical diagnostics? Our idea was to start with this, the simplest technology that we knew, which is basically printing newspapers, printing comic books, that kind of very large volume, forming of images on paper. Paper is ubiquitous, a marvelous material. There are all kinds of things you can do with it. And what we're interested in doing is developing a technology which enables us to use printing technologies and related kinds of technologies to make, rather than comic books, to make diagnostic devices. And if that works, it should be possible to reduce the costs of these devices substantially. And for example, paper has already been used for diagnostics. A pregnancy test is the first right. thing that comes to mind. It just liquid on a paper, something changes color or doesn't change color, and there it is. So what's new about what you're doing then? We can already take paper and do diagnostics with it. That's exactly right. Paper as a basis for diagnostic systems is well understood. It has not in general been applied in the developing world markets and problems, simply because it's not what the United States has been very interested in. But there are also some interesting and important technical constraints because most of the systems that we now use either do a single sort of analysis as with a pregnancy test, measures one hormone and either you are pregnant or you're not pregnant, or it measures a series of fairly simple reagents. And what we'd like to do is to be able to do a number of fairly sophisticated assays, assays called immunoassays, on a single small piece of paper at low cost all at one time. That's the basic idea. So it sounds like you're getting a little bit more complicated. Is there a simple way to do that? The simple way of doing it, we believe, is to step away from two-dimensional devices, which is what a pregnancy test basically is. It's a fundamentally the movement of liquid in a horizontal direction on a piece of paper with reagents added, and move into three dimensions in which we have technology and take, that takes a single drop of liquid, which might be blood, it might be serum, it might be something else, and divides it into a number of samples and distributes these into different test zones so that a single chip can run multiple assays. And is the chip noticeably thicker then than a piece of paper? The chip will contain at that point perhaps five, ten layers of paper and tape. And so it's it's thicker. It's more like a piece of cardboard, but it's a much more interesting functionality and there are more things that you can do with it. And 
what is the different layers going to do? How does the liquid then travel through the different layers? You said there's tape in there, but liquid doesn't flow through tape. What we do is to build systems in which we define the patterns in which the liquid can flow in a single layer of paper by printing that paper with what is effectively wax. It's not much different from the wax that goes into a crayon. And then we define channels between layers using holes punched in this tape. And the tape is simply carpet tape, so it's quite readily available. And so what one can build this way is a pathway in which there are branching points and lateral distribution points very simply by stacking layers of patterned paper and tape with holes in it. That does seem very simple then. So you have this diagnostic piece of paper. Has this been mass produced yet? Do you have it in any size quantity yet? We have technology which is proceeding smoothly towards large volumes. We hope to have the first tests which will be relatively simple, two-dimensional, not three-dimensional. We hope to have these in the field by the end of this year in quantity. And I think that will happen. Making more sophisticated multi-test site three-dimensional chips requires solving a number of engineering problems in manufacturing and quality control and things of this sort. And these are, I'm sure, soluble problems, but they haven't yet been solved. So we're progressing along that pathway. Now, once you do get these paper chips, so you see there are problems, but there are foreseeable solutions coming to that, what type of liquid do you add? So you mentioned things like blood, serum, but do you need an actual healthcare professional to take a needle and draw the blood, or how do you actually get the liquid onto the paper? It's a very interesting and important question. If one is working with a liquid such as urine, it's relatively straightforward because that can be collected without any particular skill. Collecting a blood sample, even a simple finger prick, requires a certain measure of skill. And the problem is not so much in putting a little nick in a finger. I mean, that's easy to Anyone do so long as that. you have a sharp needle. The problem is to make sure that people understand that the needle then has to be either sterilized between uses or a fresh needle obtained or something because it is possible to transfer disease from one person to another that way. Here in the United States, we simply use the needles once and discard them. In other parts of the world, the practices are a little bit more complicated. So there's a very important part of training. And ideally, I would like to find ways of solving that in such a fashion that we have only one-time use for the needle, but we're using the same technology that we're developing for the test system, but we haven't done that yet. How about a paper cut? A paper cut, exactly. I think that's precisely the right kind of answer, and that's one of the things we've thought about. You've gotten to a conclusion that we've reached early on. So having a sharp edge to a piece of paper would be a very good idea. So another problem that we sometimes have to worry about is separating blood cells from serum, the liquid in which the, the blood cells, red or white, flow. Because if we don't, either the cells may rupture during the analysis and release hemoglobin, which is red, and obscure the color of the test, or they may release other proteins which interfere. There are a lot of things that can go wrong. So the issue of finding inexpensive ways of filtering out blood cells is another bit of technology that has to be added. That's actually not hard to do because one simply inserts a little membrane that lets the liquid pass but keeps the cells from passing. However, it is a little bit expensive and requires an additional manufacturing step. Another technology that we're working on in order to help that problem is a centrifuge. A centrifuge in the world in which we live is a metal bucket attached to a motor that spins at a reasonably high speed. And it has a cage around it so that if it blows up, the pieces don't injure anyone. And this works very well in its standard equipment in any clinical laboratory. The problem with it is that in the developing world, you A, don't have centrifuges, and B, don't have power to run them in any event. So we were very interested in trying to develop a centrifuge that would be available to everyone. And the system that we settled on is an egg beater. An egg beater goes round and round. What we do is to suck up the blood sample in a small piece of polyethylene tubing. And then we seal the ends of the polyethylene tubing with a Bic lighter or a hot rock. And we tape the piece of polyethylene tubing to a egg beater 
whose second arm we have sawed off. So it's a one-legged egg beater. Okay. And if you take the handle of the egg beater and you spin it, this piece of polyethylene tubing spins around the outside, generates actually quite a nice centrifugal force, and enables you to separate serum and erythrocytes. And when you then want the serum, which is transparent, or the erythrocytes, which are packed and red, you basically just take a knife and cut the polyethylene tubing at the appropriate point and squeeze out what you want. And have you successfully been able to do that? Yes, that works very well. I mean, that, that part of the problem is solved. We're very happy with egg beaters as centrifuges. And again, we're looking at simplicity for simplicity. what seems to be a complicated problem. Precisely. Well, all this is very simple. And in the beginning, you also wanted to make this very cheap. Paper seems cheap, but if you're making it in big enough quantities and big enough pieces of paper, then you are running into a money issue. So how cheap is all this? The paper is pretty cheap, but the cost of doing research is not. And since many of the diseases that we're interested in, malaria and dengue and Chagas and things of this sort, are not really important diseases in the United States, the question is who would put in the initial money to make it work? And very interestingly, the Gates Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, has been the source of the money that's enabled us to really make a serious effort in this direction. And another thing I often will mention is that you never know what discoveries are going to do for something that you weren't trying to discover. So your paper diagnostics, while, of course, cheap for African villages, is going to be useful to us in the United States someday as well. I'm absolutely convinced that if we can get this to work as well as I think it will, because it's inexpensive, it should be useful in food safety and testing water and environmental monitoring and looking at problems related to climate change in a wide variety of other things in which you really want lots of information. If you want lots of information, you want it to be very inexpensive per piece of information, and that requires that the test system be very inexpensive. So the idea of making something cheap, sometimes people confuse cheap with with not easy well to do or not well made, but it actually is, in our experience, very difficult both scientifically and technologically to get something that really works well and is inexpensive. You have to get all the pieces to work and to work flawlessly and to be able to make it the same every time so that you can make it in very large volumes and take advantage of that. And that whole issue of how one develops a science and a technology of simplicity is, I think, a very good one for all of us to think about for the future. Well, using paper and egg beaters to try and diagnose the world, I think, is a, a pretty good step towards simplicity. It's certainly a step. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you for the opportunity. Next, we have a very special guest, Dr. Donald Ingber, a biologist, physician, engineer at the Wies Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard University. Today, he'll be talking to us about using nanotechnology in order to understand how biological things like cells work, and then in turn, using that information to try and make your own biological systems. Hi, Don. Thanks for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks so much. So cells we know are pretty small. We can see them with a microscope, though. Why would we need to go to the scale of nanotechnology in order to study them? Cells are made up of thousands of tiny little building components, of which each one is on the nanometer scale. So to be able to really probe the innards of the cell, we, we need nanotechnologies. And what things are you studying in the cell? What type of structures in the cell? I am interested in how cells are actually built so that they could exhibit their incredible properties, to, you know, the ability to change shape, grow, move. And that involves a structure that's called the, the cytoskeleton or cell skeleton. Cells literally have a skeleton like our bodies, but it's made up of nanoscale molecular filaments that function like ropes and cables and struts. So I'm using nanotechnologies to understand wh which elements do that and, and, and what functions they provide. So what kind of instruments do you use to be able to study things this small? Because you can't use a regular old microscope to see nanoscale-sized things. Well, we use microscope, and we combine it with engineered molecules that are in the form of nanotechnology that 
allow you to be able to see them. They give off light so you can localize where they are and see what structures they're in, whether in long filaments or tubes. And then we combine techniques such as uh, we have a laser nanosurgery technique where we, we use a femtosecond laser, which literally creates the, the heat of the sun, but only for an incredibly short time, sort of literally on the billionth of a millionth of a second, and we focus it through the microscope so that it's only in a tiny space, 300 nanometer cube, and in that space it vaporizes. I, I described it once as a tiny James Bond laser uh, that we use to do surgery inside cells, and it doesn't hurt the cell above or below that spot, so the cells are still functional. So we could use that, for example, to cut one filament and see what happens. So why would making a single incision with this really cool tiny little laser, how would making that incision actually teach you about the shape of a cell? So when I came into biology many, many years ago, most people thought of cells sort of as a, a stretchy membrane surrounding a goopy cytoplasm. Think of a water balloon filled with molasses. Right. Once we discovered they have this internal skeleton made of filaments, it was clear that idea is not right. I have worked for many years suggesting that cells actually use a very specific type of architecture that comes out of the Buckminster Fuller geodesic architecture world. It's called tensegrity. It comes from tensional integrity. And it's sort of the way our bodies are built with, with muscles creating tension that pulls the bones together into stable erect frames that are that are us because we're not actually big goopy things we, exactly. our skeleton gives us a definitive shape exactly and it's the tone in your muscles that actually determines whether you're stiff and hold yourself upright or whether you fall down into a you know a little huddled mass and cells similarly have filaments that create tension in fact they're the filaments that create tension in muscle but they're not as big they're smaller and so we wanted in this particular case to be able to show that that's in fact what they do. So we wanted to cut one and see if it would pull back like when you cut a muscle and it retracts or a rubber band and it retracts. And that's exactly what we saw. So in other words, you have these nice, stiff, stretched out cells and you make a single cut with one of these little nano lasers. And then what do you see happens? We see all of the other elements rearrange. It's just like if you were to cut the Achilles tendon, which is under tension, and your, your foot would pull up because there was tension in there, like a bow and a bowstring would spring open. We see the cell rearrange. We also see that um, the cell changes its shape. Uh, we also use other nanotechnologies to control how cells anchor themselves to substrates. So we're able to use nanotechnology because we want to build things that are on the size of a single cell that, that they would anchor to. And, and in this case, we wanted to make cells take on different shapes to see if that's important. So we wanted to make cells have a little anchoring island surrounded by, imagine a Teflon type region around it that it couldn't stick to. So if we have a very sticky, big circle, a cell would stick and spread out because it pulls itself out against it by creating tension. And it would look like a pancake. And if we had a smaller one, it would look like a cupcake. And a tiny one would be like a golf ball on a tee. And the chemicals would be the same. And the question is, does stretching change function? And we do that using a nanotechnology that comes from the microchip fabrication industry, where they build microchips on the nanoscale. And using that, we can show that, in fact, when cells spread, stretch, they grow. When they completely round up, our cells actually went into a suicide program. They turned on death. And in the middle, they, they stopped growing and became functional. So we put capillary blood vessel cells on little lines that kept them in a moderate degree of stretch, and they formed a, a, a tube with a lumen down the center, just like in your blood capillaries where red blood cells would flow through the middle. So stretching out these cells seems to be the best way to be able to attach them onto a surface? Well, they st attach themselves to the surface by pulling out against the surface. It would be like a rock climber pulling himself up against up a rock wall. But I think what, what it says is that it explains why in the body cells grow when you apply tension to whole tissues. So, for example, when a woman gets pregnant and the baby's growing and the uterus is expanding, the skin stretches and actually grows. And surgeons use that idea sometimes when they have a, an injury and they lose a big hunk of skin. They actually stretch the skin artificially to make new skin grow so they can cover the, the wound site with it. And this is in bone. They apply forces to make bones healing grow better. And so this explains how that works at the cell microscopic level and at the nanometer level because it's through these cytoskeletal filaments that the signals are conveyed. 
So back to your specific research, you're looking on the nanoscale, you're looking at how these cells stretch out and how they keep their shape. What would be the end goal for you and your lab in learning all of this information? Well, my lab is very broad, so we've done work in terms of helping develop uh, systems that could be used clinically for wound healing, because in wounds, giving the right tension actually makes the wounds heal better. So being able to actually manipulate the cells to grow a certain way so it heals better? To basically put materials into wounds and apply forces to wounds so that the cells get the right stretch to grow. Um, we're doing, at a more fundamental level at the Wies Institute I, I lead, we're trying to say if, if we could understand enough about how nature builds and controls and manufactures, can we use that now as an engineering principle to create our own materials? So we're also now trying to build synthetic materials that mimic this tensegrity architecture of cells, and we're beginning to be able to do that using, for example, DNA molecules that can be programmed to self-assemble and fold up on themselves like a balloon animal and build whatever structure you want. And so we're, we're just beginning to do that. Some of them, for example, mimic the shape of, uh, this is work of William Shi at my institute. He's built structures that look like viruses, but they're not dangerous. There's no infectivity at all. They have that geodesic shape They have shape a geodesic shape that actually is taken up very efficiently by cells that could be used for drug delivery, for example. Or we, we can change the mechanics of these tensegrities, structures we build at the nanoscale, and it turns out the mechanics of the matrix on which cells anchor to controls function because it makes them spread around. And it's been shown with stem cells that you can make adult stem cells, mesenchymal stem cells, go down different lineages, which basically just saying that you could also, because tensegrities, you can control their mechanics by by interacting, by, let's say, cutting one string or cutting a muscle. You can integrate them into natural tissues in your body, and you could actually change whether they're stiff or flexible, which turns out to be important. People have shown to make adult stem cells become different cell types. Which is incredibly useful. You don't have to use You don't have to use chemicals. Changes. Exactly. Right. right. So, you, yes, yeah, so you can make bone or muscle or, or, or nerve by just changing the, the stiffness of the matrix on which they stick. That's interesting. I never really thought that the shape of a cell, I knew the shape of a cell was important, but to actually be able to use the shape of the cell to dictate what that cell does and not kind of the other way around. It opens up ways to engineer that people never conceived of because we can engineer on the scale of cells. Right, or even on the scale of the filaments yeah. that make up the cells, yeah. and that's even where we get into the nano level there. So this is incredibly interesting research, and I really had no idea that we could... I knew we could manipulate things on the nano level, but it never occurred to me to be able to manipulate the cells themselves and then learn from that manipulation. So thank you very much, Don, for being here today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. That's it for this week's show. Be sure to come back next time for more of the latest in science and technology. This podcast is a production of Current Science and Technology at the Museum of Science in Boston, part of the Boston community for over 175 years. For more information, visit our website at www.mos.org slash CST or email us at podcast at mos.org. Thanks for listening.